Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good evening. Welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Gerald Harris, and I am the club's technology and science member-led forum leader, and will be your host for today's program. The Commonwealth Club is America's longest standing public forum, and especially at this time in our history, we are proud to maintain our focus on informing the public and our members on local, national, and world developments. The club was founded by citizens who had the goal of, ass of assuring that the wealth provided by nature in all of its many forms is widely shared for all of us and not wrongly exploited or wasted for the benefit of a few. The focus of the Technology and, Soci and Society member-led forum is to expose members and attendees to current and emerging issues in science and technology and the use of that and commercialization of that, of that technology in creating a world that benefits all. This is where real people come to discuss real issues, the place to be in the know. We welcome and encourage your participation in all of our programs, and more information can be found on our website at www.commonwealthclub.org. I want to welcome all of you who are listening to this program remotely on our online channel. On behalf of the club, I would also like to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for their support in providing the club's uh, digital and online uh, communications support of that. I would also like to thank the folks at Wonderfest for their support of today's program in particular. And now to today's speaker. Hi, Moya. Hello. Dr. Moya McTeer is an astrophysicist, folklorist, science communicator based in New York City. After graduating from Harvard as the first person in the school's history to study both astronomy and mythology, Moya earned her PhD in astrophysics at Columbia University, where she was selected as a National Science Foundation Research Fellow. Moya has consulted with companies like Disney and PBS uh, on their fictional world, helped design exhibits for the New York Hall of Science, and given hundreds of talks about science around the globe, including features on MSNBC, NPR, and now this news. To combine her unique set of ex expertise, Moya hosts and produces Exelor, the Exelor podcast, which explores fictional world, uh, fic oh, explores fictional world building through the lens of science. She can tell us about that. Um, when she's not researching space or imagining new worlds, Moya can be found watching re trashy reality TV with her cat, Cosmo. She's a real person. Welcome, Moya. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Gerald. I'm happy to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, what I want to do to get you started is just to, you know, allow you to introduce yourself, any opening comments, familiarize people, you know. Uh, so who, who are you? Tell us what you want us to know. Yeah, I, I'd love to share my story with you. Um, my story starts in rural Pennsylvania. I grew up in a cabin in the middle of the woods. I didn't have running water. I didn't have TV, but I did have a really big imagination. And I had a mom who shared with me her love of reading. So I, I don't think anyone in my family was surprised when I said, oh, I wrote a book. 
but I, I got out of my hometown. I went to Harvard where I studied both astronomy and mythology. There, uh, before I graduated, I wrote a science fiction novel that was set on a real planet outside of our solar system that I researched. And then I went to get my PhD in astronomy at Columbia where I specialized in studying the motion of stars around the galaxy and how that affects the habitability of different planets. Mm. Uh, and I think one thing I really want people to get out of my story, if they're interested in pursuing a career in STEM, is that there is no time that's too late to start. So many of my astronomy colleagues got interested in space when they were five years old and looked up at the night sky for the first time. I was uh, 19 when I started. I know people who went to astronomy grad school when they were in their 30s and 40s. So it is never too late to to get into STEM. Oh, great. That That's a wonderful opening. In fact, we had a uh, an astronaut here who basically said the same thing with a bunch of teenagers we had in the room. He said, you know, he was a C student in high school. You know, and mm -hmm. he didn't really get going until like late in his college career, and then he ends up, you know, being an astronaut. So he was he was echoing what you're saying in terms of really, really encouraging people. Um, Good. So let me ask you this: um, I, I, you know, read through probably at least more than half of the book. Yeah, and then I began to spot read it because I was learning so much that I was having a hard time sleeping at night because I was thinking about all the great ideas you had in this book. Okay, so. Uh, That's a compliment, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, it's a lot of stuff in there. And, and I'm sort of, you know, a science person. I got my, you know, Scientific American here and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, if you were to say, okay, to the curious person, right, here are two or three things I really want you to take uh, from this whole topic because you know, a lot of people kind of don't know how to think about this topic. They don't know what they want to grab, grab a hold to. So there's so many good ideas in that. Give us your top two or three. You say, hey, really think about these. Yeah, I'd love that. So I think the first thing that I would want people to get out of this book, the first thing that I want people to know about space is how big it is is uh, in, in space, like its physical volume, but also in time. I feel like we as humans have a really hard time imagining these huge scales, but I hope that by reading the book, you get a sense for how far apart stars are and how far apart different galaxies are and how long it takes things to happen in space. I mean, it can take 10 to 100 million years for a planet to form around a new star. So I hope people get a sense of scale. Um, I also hope that they start seeing space as a dynamic thing. So many people think of space as static, that it's standing still and it's not changing, but space is moving and changing all the time. Our Milky Way galaxy is moving towards the Andromeda galaxy at 100 kilometers per second. That's really fast. Um, our sun is moving around the galaxy. We do one full orbit every 250 million years. So we're moving, but these scales are huge. And I would hope that by getting more comfortable with those scales, people feel less intimidated by space and that they maybe start to zoom out from their own individual perspective a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's something I really took from the book as well, which is that maybe there's something about the human experience that the, but we don't understand that we're moving. So just in the short mm -hmm. period of time that you and I have been sitting here, we are a very long way from where we were five minutes ago. Right. Yes. I mean, like yeah, a very absolutely. long way from where we were. Right. And that, you know, all, all of this is moving, including not only is the earth moving, but the solar system is moving. Right. Yep. I mean, the it's solar all moving. system, the galaxy, it's all moving on different scales. Right. 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 So I, I think can you say more about these distances? Because it's, it seems to me that when someone says light, it's traveling at 186,000 miles per second. I mean, one way I kind of think about that is someone told me that when the sun strikes my face, those, mm -hmm. those photons left there about eight and a half to nine minutes ago. That, that's yes. just that distance. So can you give us more about how far this is? Really, really far. Uh, one calculation that young astronomers often do when they're in their 
uh, early classes is to calculate how many stars will collide when the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies merge in about five billion years. Uh -huh. And I, I remember starting to do that calculation and assuming that it's going to be you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of stars having collisions because it seems like that's what should happen. Each of these galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars in them. But I was proven wrong. <laughs> I did the calculation where I, I took into account how fast these galaxies are moving and how far apart stars are on average in each of these galaxies. And what I learned and what most astronomers get when they do that calculation is that only like a handful of stars will actually collide because wow. even though there are so many stars. They're so far apart. I think that uh, illustrates how how spread apart things are. Um, right. The fun thing about those those photons that take eight minutes to get from the sun is that uh, they take eight minutes to get from the surface of the sun to you. But those same photons actually probably took millions of years to get from the center of the sun to the surface. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that we don't think about something that's hitting our face is over a million years old. Mm hmm Yeah, that photon has gone through a lot before it reaches you. Imagine we, we astronomers are studying galaxies that are billions of light years away, collecting the photons that were emitted by those galaxies a billion years ago. Uh, that's how long it takes the light to get to us because that's how far away they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, those photons, they make it billions of light years to come to us and they get stopped from hitting the ground by, by our body being in the way or by our telescope being in the way. And I think that that's just so beautiful that these photons go on such a journey and then get trapped on our puny little human instrument that we make. <laughs> Can you say more about that? Because one of the things I, the question I kind of puzzle here is, how small we are because we're really 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 teeny and we don't live that long right i mean yeah. on the scale of you know and uh it's sort of like this thing we have in our head called our brain is kind of a blunt instrument for what it is we're, we're, we're trying to figure out so when you think about human beings and in, in, in the sense of the I mean, how, how should we think about ourselves in, in relation to the universe? I mean, that's a kind of a crazy question, but I, I really don't have an answer to it once I realize how insignificant we are. Right. It's exactly the type of question that I think humans should be asking. One of the things I tried to address in this book, uh, there's actually a, a section in it when the Milky Way, because this book is told from the perspective of the galaxy, compares the human lifespan to that of a mayfly, which only lives for about a day here on Earth. And the Milky Way says, uh, do you ever wonder why the mayfly bothers to do anything? I mean, it lives its whole life in one room of your house. Uh, why does it bother? And then the Milky Way says that that's how it feels about us humans. It's mm. a maze that we even bother to do anything at all. And so what I was trying to do with that was say, yeah, we are tiny uh, physically in space and in time. We don't live for that long, but that really does mean that all of the moments we have are precious mm. and that we should make the most of the time we have and make the most of the, the possible connections with the humans that we can. Oh, I think that, that, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, let's, let's talk about the book because I think the beautiful thing you did in the book is you, you kind of, there's a, a, almost a time sequence, you know, from the beginning and where's it going all the way to the end. I mean, so you, well, as I'm reading the book, I feel like I'm kind of, you know, kind of moving through really large scales of, uh, of time, but at least there's, there's some, some yeah. sequence there. Um, but along the way, you stop off at some very interesting points, right? Uh, so when you start talking about like gravity and black holes and dark energy and those kinds of things, uh, tell us how you put those things in perspective because it's such a dense area 
but you, you put it in sequentially. So just walk us through what your, your thought process is there. Yeah, I mean, the book was in the form of an autobiography. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be inspired by, by uh, autobiographies of humans, and those usually are written chronologically. It starts with the, the subject's birth and then goes until, you know, whenever the, the author is writing their autobiography. Mm -hmm. But the Milky Way has this uh, extra, I don't know, oomph to it. Like it knows what's going to happen next, unlike a human writing their own autobiography. So the Milky Way can actually project forward to say how it is going to die eventually mm. when the universe ultimately mm. Mm. ends uh, or loses all of its energy. So it made sense for me to go chronologically through that. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, right. So, uh, but when you start talking about the structure of the thing itself, right? and black holes, dark matter, dark energy, how it shapes things and how, you know, it doesn't interact with anything and it kind of, you know, it gets kind of descriptive. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Sometimes you can describe something, what it does, but that still doesn't mean you know what it is. There's a lot of that in astronomy. We know how dark matter or babes, we can see it interacting gravitationally with stars and other galaxies, but we don't know what dark matter is made of. We, we cannot see it. It doesn't interact with light. Photons seem to just pass right through it as if they don't care that the dark matter is there, uh, but we can still see gravitational influence. So that's, that's how we learn about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of mathematics here. I mean, there, there's a lot of math behind what goes in the book, yes, but there, are, there is no math in the book. I'm right, sure, I right, make sure right, of that. Right, yeah, right, right. But I was thinking, like, you know, basically when I was, was you know, reading through it, I was thinking, well, there's a lot of math behind figuring out the fact that there's dark energy in the universe, right? I mean, someone had to do a calculation that something seems to be missing here based on how the universe is operating. There must be something there. And so you have some mm -hmm. sense of what percentage it must be and all these kinds of things. But I mean, talk about your, your background and being a, sort of a mathematician as well. You know, how you grew up and, you know, a lot of people say people don't like math. You know, girls <laughs> are not good at math, but that's obviously not, not true of you. <laughs> uh, well, it's not true in general. Girls are great at math. Um, Girls, young women, non-binary folks, they have interest in STEM and they are really good at it. The problem, the, the reason we don't see a lot of women in STEM careers or people of color in STEM careers is because it's not a very welcoming environment for us. I loved science. I enjoyed much of doing research, but I got sick and tired of the way that I was treated in some spaces. And I know that I didn't get the worst of it. I know that there are other uh, young researchers who are coming up who are trying to, they're having to fight to stay in this field, in this community, because they're dealing with all sorts of nonsense, right? So. Um, yeah, I think that it's not a lack of interest. It's not a lack of skill. It is a, a matter of, of what we call the leaky pipeline in academia, letting people slip through the cracks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, um, you know, lack of a, I guess I would call it a welcoming, encouraging environment for people mm -hmm. who don't look like what they think they should look like or something of that nature. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine you are, let's, I'll use my experience as an example. I was 17 when I went to college. I came from a really rural town, a public school that definitely did not prepare me as well as my other peers had been prepared by their fancy prep schools. Mm -hmm. And I, I walked into those physics classrooms and didn't see anyone who looked like me. When I went to, to meetings, when I was looking for potential advisors, I didn't see anyone who looked like me. And I had, a, I had one professor uh, my freshman year tell me that I would never make it as a physicist because I was struggling too hard with the coding. I had never used a computer as anything other than a word processor before that year. So I was teaching myself coding on the fly. 
Um, I had another professor my senior year who told me that I would never make it through grad school. And here I am, Dr. Moya with a PhD. So these people say these things to young impressionable uh, students and researchers coming up through the field and it can crush their confidence. Mm. The fact that I'm still here today is because of the small but growing community of women and people of color in astronomy who supported me and surrounded me in that moment and helped me see that those professors were wrong and that I did bring value to the field. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm so glad you're able to, to express that because I think we need people to hear that encouragement from you to see your success, to validate their interest, to validate their drive. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for, for sharing that and, and letting us hear that part of your, your story. Yeah. So, um, so now let me ask you kind of a tough question here, <laughs> okay? Uh, I'm ready. Yeah, and, and it has to do with the fact that as I was reading the book, I felt that, well, I'm learning a lot about the Milky Way, but I'm also learning a lot about you and your personality because, as you know, the Milky Way actually doesn't have a, a personality here. So, what? You know, some what do you of your, mean? It's not a person? You know, I, I don't know if the personality is exactly like yours, but I found it entertaining, though, right? And so yeah. what I picked up from you, and you can comment on this if you like, but, I mean, you're, you're pretty matter-of-fact. Uh, Yes. Facts are important to you. <laughs> Logic is important to you. Common sense is important to you. And I, I kind of reading it that you don't suffer fools very uh, easily. <laughs> if no, I was reading a book, I like, well, you know. use that ex same <laughs> use that same exact uh, expression the other day when I was talking to my mom. I was like, "Mom, I just I just don't suffer fools." <laughs> that that was the impression I got from, from the book. Is like, well, let's just you know. Uh, really be, you know, factual here. And so mm -hmm. what that brought up for me, though, is your comment really about mythology and folklore. You know, tell us a little bit about your thinking there and how this fits into, you know, how you sort of develop your, your, your worldview. Absolutely. So I studied both astronomy and folklore in college. As a, a folklore major, my specialty was fictional world building. So we can absolutely talk about that. Mm -hmm. But I see mythology and folklore, these stories that people have been telling and passing down through cultures as an early attempt at science. Mm -hmm. Because they weren't just making stories up. I mean, some of them were. Uh, they were for pure entertainment. But a lot of mythology that sticks with us today was useful. It was based on observations that people made of the world around them. And these stories were meant to try and explain what was happening. You know, this is why we have myths about the changing of the seasons or thunderstorms or eclipses. This was their attempt at trying to make sense. Um, but it was also a way of encoding important practical knowledge, like how to use space to keep time or navigate or connect with other members of your culture. Um, there's this one example that I really love of Aboriginal Australian mythology. They had a constellation in their sky and it was actually um, a dark constellation. So it's not made of stars that you connect the dots with. It's actually a, like a void, a dark oh, okay, patch. Got it. Yes, that, yes. Yeah, that is shaped like an emu. They call it the emu constellation. And that constellation appears in the sky around the same time that the Earth emus started laying eggs every year. Uh -huh. And the Australians, the Aboriginal Australians, would be able to use those eggs as nourishments. The constellation reappearing. So they didn't have Google calendars. They didn't have cell phones to put reminders on. So they needed this constellation to be like, oh, okay, we have, we have the food now. And there are so many other examples of that around the world and throughout time up until a few hundred years ago. And that is why I think that mythology is a type of science. Um, I'm glad that we have science today in the way that we do with telescopes and beakers and hard numbers, because I'm a nerd. I love numbers. Yeah, yeah. But I also see and appreciate the value in 
indigenous knowledge and in uh, traditional knowledge that if you, I like to say that if you squint your eyes and turn your head to the side, you can look at those myths and see some scientific facts. Uh-huh, 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 yeah. So um, it, it's interesting, there's sort of a uh, way that when you think about mythology, uh, sometimes I think the fact that in industrialized societies, we don't see stars, we don't see the Milky Way, we don't see these things. So, you know, we're out at the bar or whatever we're doing at night, but we're not, you know. And in other societies where we don't have, though they don't have all this stuff, they can look up every night right. and see, see that, right? How do you yeah, think that affects consciousness? like 80%. Yeah. Ooh, big questions. Yeah. Um, so I will say the Dark Sky Association estimates that about 80% of the night sky for people around the world is affected by both light and air pollution. This makes it harder to see the stars, which makes it harder for us to connect with them. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you, you ask how that affects like our consciousness. I think it has had a real effect. Uh, psychologists have studied how the loss of different types of connections for modern day humans has had a negative impact on psyches. And one of those lost connections is connection with nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. you, you can this in terms of like getting out to, to the forest or like seeing greenery, but the night sky is also a really important part of nature. So many of our ancestors connected to the night sky daily and it was a huge part of their lives and that's a part of the human experience that so many of us are missing now but i think that experience of looking up at the night sky coupled with our modern scientific understanding of the universe would be so powerful um, in helping people shift their perspective to thinking about things bigger than us when astronauts come back from space they talk about something called the overview effect Mm -hmm. where they they can look at every single person on earth through tiny little window on the international space station and when you're up there um these identities that we have like race or sexuality or religion um those start to seem less important when you can see the whole picture mm -hmm. and instead you see us as humans you mm -hmm. stop seeing borders you stop seeing these these conflicts that are real for us but in like in the universe's mind they're really petty i think if we could have more people look up at the night sky regularly and feel connected to it while knowing that it is an ever-expanding universe billions of light years across. Ah, oh, that's such a powerful message. You know, I completely agree. I mean, I was, I was humbled by it several years ago. We were off um, uh, in the north, in Northern California and at night and uh, the stars came out at a particular time. And when I first saw it, it, it was so bright and it was, it was just like they were right on my eyeball, right? <laughs> and I was, initially I was frightened by it. I'm gonna be honest with you, I was initially frightened by it, right? Because mm -hmm. I hadn't, you know, but it also humbled me in a sense of, not only how small I am, but just how wonderful existence is. Yes, right? I love that. You know, I was, I was just humbled by that, right? And so there's something to me that says, the fact that some people aren't humbled occasionally by the magnificence of the universe, maybe it leads to some thought process that's not healthy. Yeah, I think uh, Kendrick Lamar should write a song with me about how space makes you humble. Yeah, yeah, no, it really makes you there. So um, uh, let me just su suggest the people who are watching this online, please submit questions. Uh, they're gonna text those to me and I'll be able to uh, uh, address those to, to Dr. Mc McTeer. Um, let me uh, throw out a, a topic that's very popular and other people are talking about because it just happened, which is the, the Webb um, telescope, right? What we're learning, what we're mm -hmm. seeing. So, so give us your you know, take on that and what it means for us and what we can do with it and all that stuff. Love to. Yeah, the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope or JWST, um, 
or there's a movement to get the name of the telescope changed. Some people are calling it the, the Gelescope Wellescope Space Telescope. No matter what you call it, it is an amazing instrument that we launched out into space on Christmas of last year, actually. And it has, in the last month or so, given us some of its first images. And they're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have images no, I've seen you can some pull of them, up yeah. of them, but like, they're they're incredible. And what I love about them is that they they aren't showing us spaces of the sky that we haven't seen before. What what DWST is doing is showing us those same parts of the sky in more detail than even some astronomers ever imagined we would have. Uh, there's this beautiful image of the, the deep field, and you can see in this tiny patch of sky that is as big as a grain of sand held out at arm's length, you can see thousands of galaxies in that image. And some of those galaxies were the first galaxies ever formed less than a billion years after the Big Bang. We can measure how far away they are. And this is helping us understand more about the universe was like early on. It's helping us understand more about how galaxies form and how they can change. But JWST is not just a one trick pony, mm -hmm. it is also looking at star formation. There's another gorgeous image of the um, the Carina Nebula. Some some people call it like the the pillars of, of life or like the cliffs or whatever. But we are seeing through the clouds of gas and dust that we couldn't see through before to see new stars forming. Um, there's another really great instrument on JWST that doesn't take images at all. It's a spectrograph. So it looks at uh, it's actually looking a lot at the atmospheres of planets to try and figure out what elements you can find in those atmospheres. And they, we got this gorgeous spectrum of a planet uh, that showed us that it had water vapor in its atmosphere. And we could see it so clearly, which is something we'd never be able to do before JWST. So um, I feel like I could talk about this forever, but it's just, it's a really exciting telescope that's helping us get a, a closer look at space that um, astronomers have wanted for a long time. Yeah, and, and you just said something that I don't think people understand, which is those images are from a very tiny look at just a very small little area. Yeah. In concern of, I mean, there's a lot more so that if that's what's in, in this small little area, oh my God, I mean, wow. Exactly, wow, like the, the thousands of galaxies in, in that one tiny patch. And we, we have in astronomy something called the cosmological principle. And it uh, tells us some basic tenets of the universe. And one of them is that the universe is isotropic. And uh, that means that the universe is, is the same everywhere. So if we are seeing thousands of galaxies in this one little patch of sky, then that means all of the other patches of sky also have thousands of galaxies in them. Yeah, that's why when people say <laughs> like, if there's not a another planet out there with some life on it. This is a big waste of space, right? I mean, this has got to be. Yeah. I mean, we, we just can't be that unique, can we? I, I just can't I believe we're that you. unique. I love that quote. Yeah. The, <laughs> so there are um, a couple hundred billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And there are billions, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. And we think that on average, every star has a couple of planets. So there are trillions of planets out there. If we are the only planet that hosts life, like what, how, how? There's no, yeah, you're right. There's no way we're that special or unique, but I do have to um, make my PA advisor proud and okay. say that as a scientist, we have not found evidence of alien life. Right, right, right. Right. Well, let me go back to that, that web photograph, because this is something that, that I'm confused about, right? I remember, I think it was either BBC or someone uh, had a, a write-up about this, and they said, well, you see the ones that are red in color versus these others, so that something mm -hmm. about, um, this is an image, this is not a photograph, right? 
So what that tells us is that, in a sense, there's some data and some information uh, around certain spectrums that allowed us to create these images, right? So yes. a, a galaxy that may be, you know, really way out there, close to, you know, the beginning of the Big Bang, it, it's, it's probably not still there in that exact form, right? Because that's a long time ago, right? right? So we just have this sort yes. of picture of it, but, you know, <laughs> that, that's not what it is today, right? This, uh, I'm understanding this. Is, is that correct? Right. Yes, you are correct. We are not seeing those images how they are today. Um, for that deep field image, uh, some of those those red galaxies, we are seeing them how they were, you know, like five to ten billion years ago. It's mm. almost like um, imagine you have the the fastest camera in the world that can take the fastest picture but you're trying to take a picture of a moving train by the time you snap the picture and it shows up on your screen and you take a look at it the train is far gone right but you still took a picture of that train that's what i was trying to get you to yeah because i was thinking well i wonder do people really understand that this is an image it's not like a Exactly. It's not, it's not the same as a photograph, right? Well, even, so you, I was a little confused, uh, actually, when you asked the question about mm -hmm. the distinction between an image and a photograph. And then mm -hmm. you said that this image has data in it. Photographs also have data in them because mm -hmm. the way that modern photographs are taken is that the camera collects photons and essentially puts those photons into different right. blocks on a grid to show right. you uh, like what the image looks like. Mm -hmm. And we can, we're essentially just taking pictures of space and looking at the photons in each grid to see what kind of photons are there. But, but this was, as I said, infrared light right. uh, yes. that they were so using for some of those, so it's, it's not, not like, the same thing, right? No, it's a very different thing. If yeah. we, with our eyes, were able to look at that area of space with enough like magnification, we wouldn't see what these images are showing. Ah. Um, because most of the stuff in these images um, it's it's dust and gas, which is what the the infrared shows us. Right, right. So now this is this goes back to another point I, I think I pulled from your book, which is that the limitations of these things we have as eyes, what we can see, uh, this, this brain we have is limited, right? So yeah. I, I kind of got the impression that even though we're kind of in learning mode, and you kind of talk about this at the end of the book, that you really want us to kind of stay in this learning mode, but are, are we handicapped in some kind of way by the human desire to think that every, you know, what we see is all there is? I mean, is that a, is that a problem, really? It was. For a long time, we only knew about space in terms of photons. We were only collecting information about the light out there in space. Then we started thinking about other other ways to collect information. And we started looking at gravitational waves to see how, uh, how mass and matter uh, gets distributed around space. Um, we now have instruments that can measure temperature, that can measure um, electric currents and the strength of electric fields. These are senses that we don't have as humans, but other animals do. I mean, there are sharks that uh, have this, uh, this sense of electric impulses around them. Um, we can sense magnetic fields too, magnetic and electrical fields, but just because we don't have those senses doesn't mean we don't have scientific instruments to measure those those quantities. Mm -hmm. And so now we are putting those types of instruments on telescopes and we're not just getting light data anymore. We are not just limited by what we could see, uh, right. even though like we, we have been exploring in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum mm -hmm. for a, a, a hundred years. Right. right, 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 right. So here's a question from one of our online listeners. And uh, uh, she says, uh, do you have a, a favorite constellation 
and someone says, one that might be worthy of a tattoo. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I have a tattoo of the constellation Orion, which is more than just Orion's belt. Uh, that, that is my favorite constellation. And actually, here is a, a little... A little secret Moya tidbit. Um, I am terrible to go stargazing with. I got this tattooed on my body because it's the only constellation I reliably ID in mm -hmm. the night sky. Oh, okay. It's also, I've, I've always had a very personal connection to Orion because it uh, comes up into the sky uh, in January around my birthday. Um, and I've always loved Greek mythology, especially that the story of Orion the Hunter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, great, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let me give you one other question here. Um, someone says, uh, kind of what we were talking about, which is how do we know that these images, you know, the infrared ones are from billions of years ago? How do we know that? I think that's more of a technical question, eh? It is a technical question. Yeah. Um, so we have a few different methods in astronomy of telling how far away something is. Um, these methods are good for objects at different distances. So if you want to measure a relatively close object, something that is um, on our side of the Milky Way galaxy, you would measure that using par parallax and you would get a distance in parsecs. If you want to measure something a little bit further away, like in a in a near galaxy on the other side of our local group, our neighborhood of about 50 galaxies, then you would start using the next rung on the distance ladder, which is looking for um, what we call standard candles. These are supernovae explosions or, or bright stars that we know how bright they should be. And based on how bright they look to us, we can figure out how far away they are because we know how light uh, gets dimmer the further uh, away you are from the object. Uh, uh. When you get to really, really far objects like some of these galaxies, the, the rung on the distance ladder that you use is something called cosmological redshift. Uh, redshift and blue shift are the Doppler effect in action. Um, the Doppler effect is is often like the the ambulance siren that goes right. by you. It gets really high and then it gets low as yeah as the ambulance moves away. That's sound waves, but light waves also work similarly. Mm -hmm. If something is moving away from you, imagine uh, the photons coming off of that object moving away from you. Because it's moving away, each second, let's say, the photons that are getting sent from it have to move further and further away from you. So it feels like those photons are coming to you more slowly. Ah. Um, and because yeah, because the the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum is less energetic and slow means less energy, mm -hmm. we say that it gets red shifted. And mm -hmm. then the, the total opposite of that, if something is coming towards you, then the photons seem to come faster and faster. Got and it, that is, yeah, that's blue shifting. So we can look at these galaxies that are really far away, see that they look redder than we expect mm. them to. And remember, this isn't, uh, it can look redder to your eye, but it probably doesn't. This is all based on um, things outside of our vision range that our computers can measure. And based on how red those galaxies look, that tells us how far away, um, like how fast they are moving away from us. And mm -hmm. because we have modeled the expansion of the universe, if we know how fast something is moving away, we also how far away it must be from us in the universe. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So is that also kind of a sense of how we know that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate? Is it kind yes. of wrapped up in all of that as well? Yeah. Absolutely. That is a relatively new finding. A uh, hundred years ago, or let's say 150 years ago, they would have Actually, they probably didn't know the universe was expanding 150 years ago. Yeah. But first they had to learn that the universe was expanding. And then they had to learn that the expansion was speeding up. Mm -hmm. And this was one of Edwin's 
most famous discoveries, uh, he was looking at supernovae in really distant galaxies. And what he noticed was that the galaxies further away from us are moving faster away from us. So mm. he, he realized that the, um, the far expanses of the universe are accelerating away from us, not mm. just moving mm. away from us at a constant velocity. Right, right. But you know, see that, that makes me wonder is that this concept of years is kind of a bad thing. I mean, just because it, you know, <laughs> I don't think we think about this little star we have here. That, that <laughs> maybe, maybe we're blinded by the fact that we even, because maybe the universe is, is, might be relatively new from the Big Bang. I mean, well, we, we think it's 14 and a half billion years old. We think, oh, that's a long time. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not a long time at all. <laughs> we don't right, have we, any proof that that's a long time, do we? No, well, every, well a long time. What, what does that mean, right? Phrase. Yeah, exactly, time is relative, time, uh, t technically is a construct. We, we can perceive time and that's, that's a real thing that we are perceiving, but we can still um, kind of manipulate time in our heads. If you are having, time moves faster when you're having fun, right? Like, so time is relative. It can feel like it moves at different speeds in different scenarios. And there is this really fun physical phenomenon called gravitational time dilation. When you are closer to a massive object, time does move more slowly for you, mm -hmm. but you don't feel it moving more slowly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, time, time is weird. And mm -hmm. we have decided to measure time in, in this arbitrary unit of years, uh, which is based on how far away we are from our sun. There, there's no reason that anyone else in the universe would use this unit of time. <laughs> That's what I'm but, thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that but important? Just because, yeah. But just because we're using this unit of time doesn't mean that that affects the, the actual quantity of time that has elapsed. Sure, sure, um, sure. A, a galaxy like the Milky Way that has been around for, for 10 billion years, 14 billion is not very long to them. But we humans live 100 years if we're lucky, so 14 billion sure is a heck of a lot. Um, we just happen to use this arbitrary unit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So but I guess I'm trying to get to the point of uh, I guess maybe I've been watching too many, you know, like science fiction <laughs> movies or something. But this notion that if this thing is expanding, at some point it's going to stop expanding and it's going to, you know, <laughs> come. Now, we have no proof of that. Right. OK. So I'm not saying well, that's that, true. Right? That's go ahead. I guess you haven't gotten to the uh, to the death chapter where we talk about the potential fates of the universe um, in one scenario universe continues to expand forever and uh, as the universe gets bigger the matter gets more distributed and the average temperature cools down until it reaches absolute zero and there's no energy or motion so in that scenario the universe does expand forever mm. there are a couple other mm. hypothesized scenarios mm -hmm. uh, one mm -hmm. where the universe expands and then contracts in on itself. Uh, there's one where it expands, contracts back, back in, and then like yo-yo goes back out again and is always in this, uh, this like oscillation over billions of years. Ooh, wow. Scientists think with our current understanding of dark energy, which is the, the force that is making the universe expand at an accelerating rate, we think that the universe will probably expand forever, but we mm -hmm. have a lot more to learn about dark energy before we can say for sure. Right, right, right. And by the way, since we're not going to be around forever, it probably <laughs> doesn't matter to us anyway, right? I mean, you know, because the, the, the notion that human beings will be around a trillion years from now is uh, wishful thinking, would you say? Right. Absolutely. Um, you and I weren't way around, uh, and nothing that we would recognize as our descendants would be around. Yeah. Time all of this stuff happens, our sun won't even be the sun that we know. It would have puffed up into a red giant, and you know, tr a trillion years from now, the sun will collapse back into a white dwarf star. So um, humans won't be around. Our Earth probably won't even be around. It is not 
practical for us to think about this stuff, but that is what I love about astronomy. It is an observational science that we do, not because we think it's going to make our lives better or easier, we study space because we're curious about it and because we can study it. Uh, we study space to learn the more like philosophical answers to, to important questions like where did we come from? Um, and that, I love that about astronomy. Mm, mm, mm. It's interesting you should say that because one of my questions was, well, you know, should we be trying to get anything out of this, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, human beings, we, we want to make money off of everything, right? We want to, in fact, there are people who call the International Star Registry, please don't sue me, people, but, you know, they'll, they'll sell you a star and put your name on it and <laughs> send it somewhere and, you know, you can send them a hundred bucks, you know, so I'm, I'm sure you think about it. it must be something better than that, but, I mean, maybe, maybe yeah. we should be thinking about studying the galaxy in our normal sense of, you know, we're going to get something out of this, right? I mean, maybe we should just I mean, learn. I, I think it is a beautiful fact of human nature that we get curious about things and can just learn for the sake of learning. I think that's beautiful. Um, but there are also very concrete, practical uh, results that come out of astronomy research. The, uh, the medical clean room is, is uh, one example um, it was like the technique that they use to make a sterile environment in medical exam rooms. It's it, that technique was originally developed because people didn't want their telescopes to get dusty. Mm. Uh, things like Wi-Fi, GPS. Uh, we have these technologies, and we we have improved our quality of life in this way because of our study of space. Mm -hmm. A lot of mm -hmm. these were developed for the study of space or they were an unintended consequence. Um, a lot of space research is actually funded by uh, the Department of Defense. And so there, we can talk about the ethics of that, but there, there are a lot of uh, ways that astronomy research does um, create these these good things for humanity, aside from just knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so, so let me ask you this. The other thing I, I took away from this book is that, and I had this idea in my mind that the, the notion that we would ever be able to build a spaceship mm -hmm. that could travel at the speed of light and get us to another habitable planet. Uh, it's somewhat of a stretch, you know. I thought it was like suppose you were like an ant, and you taped yourself to a rock, and felt that you would leave the ocean in San Francisco, and land in Japan. You know, what I mean, yeah. <laughs> in my head, that this is going to occur, but anything in between there is kind of remote, right? So, I mean, is it, is it that crazy that we think we could ever get to another habitable planet? I mean, should people just stop that? We should stop the mindset of colonizing other plants, but if we want to explore for the sake of exploring and forming mid connections with whatever we find out there, I don't think it's too absurd. Um, we would have to develop um, maybe some sort of cryostasis. We were just trying to put people on a spaceship and fly that spaceship to another planet. Um, but maybe we develop wormhole technology. Uh, maybe we could use some sort of really complicated system of uh, flinging ourselves around different stars and planets using their gravity to, to slingshot us really far into space. There are scenarios that I can think of to get us to other planets, but um, all of those are really hard, so maybe we just take care of the one we have. Uh, I kind of thought about that too, you know, that yeah. uh, we, I mean, because I, I want to do people really understand, I, th I think you would say this, the Earth itself is a spaceship. We're on yes. one right now. Yes, thank you, Gerald. We are on a spaceship, we're traveling through space, and you know what? We are made of space. Like, we, we are space too. Yeah, I mean, we're on the thing now, right? I mean, so when you look out at night, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're looking out the window of the, of the spaceship, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're doing. Yes. Right? The atmosphere is one giant that. window. 
The atmosphere right. also blocks a lot of ultraviolet light the way that windows do. So this is a great analogy. Right, 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 right. Can, can you get people to understand um, how long it takes the Milky Way to make one big, you know, revolution? And it's dragging us along with it. How long does that take? The Milky Way? Milky Way or yeah. the solar system? No, just the Milky Way. Um, and this is difficult for us to think of because we don't have a good coordinate system outside of the galaxy. But you can think of the Milky Way as one of two big nodes in the local group that is this like spherical collection of mostly small galaxies. Um, the Milky Way and Andromeda are technically orbiting around this local group, but because they are the most dominant um, gravitational influences, they're mostly just moving towards each other. Mm. So uh, mm. to say that the Milky Way is orbiting around is kind of difficult. Well, no, I'm just saying we as it do... rotates itself, you know, on, on, on its... Oh! Yeah. As you know, because everything is oh, okay. rotating, right? Right. So, is yes. that someone told me that it was six hundred and fifty million years or something? I don't know what the number is. Maybe you know, but so as we're as, as yeah, this spaceship it, that we're on is like moving through <laughs> the universe, it takes us about <laughs> a long time to make one big revolution, right? Yes. Oh, okay. I I understand the question yeah. now. Um, we we have measured the velocity of, of stars going around the galaxy at different distances from the center of the galaxy. Uh, when, we, when we plot that out, the, the rotational velocity versus the distance, we get what we call a rotation curve. Ah. So uh, the speed is different depending on where you are in the galaxy. Ooh, wow, okay. Here, where our sun is, it takes us 250 million years to make it around. And wow. our sun is about halfway between the center and the edge of the oh, galaxy. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, but if you go out further, to closer to the edge, it actually gets um, slower. The stars mm. are moving more slowly, it takes them longer to make an orbit. Not just Got because it. it's bigger, but because they are they are actually moving more slowly. Oh wow, 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 wow. So that's interesting that we kind of know where we are in in the whole construct of the Milky Way. We kind of have some idea that we're kind of in in the middle kind of thing. Is that is that right? Yeah. God, in that's... the in the middle of the disk, not in the yeah. middle of the galaxy. Yeah. Wow. 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 <laughs> so you, you, you talk a little bit about, and there's a couple of questions on here about, about black holes. And there seems to be mm -hmm. one in the middle of the Milky Way. So help us understand that. You got to help me with that. Yeah. Where, 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 where should we yeah, be let, thinking about, about with about these things? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So here, here's a little 101 on black holes. Um, almost every galaxy in the universe has a supermassive black hole at its center. Our oh. Milky Way does, and that oh. black hole is called Sagittarius A star. But that's not the only black hole in the galaxy. There, the estimates say that there are about 10 million black holes in the galaxy, but most of them are a lot smaller. Uh, the Sagittarius A star, the one at the center uh -huh. of the Milky Way, uh -huh. that is four million times more massive than the sun most black holes are only a, f a few times more massive than our sun. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So that's why it's called supermassive. Right. Um, so every galaxy has them, and every galaxy has uh, many of them. Wow. But when you're looking at a black hole itself, there are a few different components to it. There's mm. the, the actual black hole at the center, and all that is is a an object so dense, so heavy, but so small that light cannot escape it. If a photon tries to escape the black hole, it would get pulled back in by its gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, this, mm -hmm. That's the center that we can't see. But if you have a massive enough black hole, then around it creates uh, this event. Well, the event horizon is the edge. And then around that is an accretion disk. This is a disk of material that is in the black hole because it's been drawn in by the gravity. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And, then, and then some really energetic black holes that we see have what we call 
jets. These are streams of light coming off of the black hole. Um, and the only parts of that that we can see are the jets and the accretion disk. We cannot mm. see the black hole itself. Mm. One big misconception about black holes is that they act like vacuums, just sucking things in. Yes. But in reality, they're not that active. They're not that insidious. Black oh, okay. holes are just gravity pits waiting oh, okay. for things to fall down into them. Uh -huh. So if the sun overnight suddenly became a black hole with the same mass, our orbit wouldn't change. We would continue to, to orbit at this exact same spot. We would all die because we would lose the heat and the energy from the sun, but yeah. it wouldn't be because we got sucked into the black hole. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. So that means we shouldn't worry about some random black hole floating through and uh, sucking us into it or something. No, no, okay. that's not something we have to worry about. They're too far Especially away for that, right? Not, not where we are in the Milky Way. We are in, I like to, to call it the suburbs of the Milky Way oh, okay, galaxy. Okay, okay, it's okay, not okay. very active where we are. Oh, okay, okay. So if there are some other black holes out there, it's a long way from us, right? Yeah, we are not in danger okay, from right. a pull. Okay, great, okay. So um, I wanna go back to you at, uh, we got about another seven or eight minutes here, and I want, I want now to go back to you as sort of this 12-year-old um, girl. Okay. Right, who was curious, and who obviously was brighter than most people around her at the time. They just didn't know it. <laughs> oh, they knew it. Right, okay. But now, so <laughs> when you see, imagine you, you, you run into some other young kid like that, right? Maybe it's a young woman in mm. Pakistan, or, mm. you know, a, a young woman on an Indian reservation, or, mm -hmm. you know, so what, what, what would you say to them from this standpoint now to sort of tell them to like keep up the good work or whatever, but how, how would you really want to address a 12 year old budding genius that you knew really had the stuff? Mm. I would tell them that more than ever before, it is easier to make your dreams come true. Um, it, if you if you want to do research, if you want to get into acting, like whatever you want to do, we have the internet now where you can learn new skills on your own. This is of course assuming they have access to the internet, which I know not everyone has. Mm -hmm. But if you if you do, then it is a lot easier to to make your your dreams come true. Um, then I would I would want to tell them my story and how I made my dreams come true because I think I'm living my dreams right now. Um, I would also, the, the last piece of advice I would give them as I faded away, assuming this is a, a time sensitive time travel situation. Um, I would say that you don't know what anyone else's journey is and no one knows what your journey is. So don't try to compare yourself to other people because it's not, it's not a good scientific comparison. You don't know where they started. You don't know where they're trying to go. So if you look to someone next to you and try to compare yourself to them, then it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. You're not running the same race. Mm, mm, mm. That, that's so interesting because what I, what I find is that in this comparing myself to others, there's a level at which I may be not only misunderstanding myself, but in some kind of way seeking approval. You, you know what I mean? It's mm. sort of comparison has an approval element in it. You know what I mean? And so I hear yeah. what you're saying is stop seeking other people's approval in the first place. Yeah, so that You absolutely. don't need to have your life governed by that. Mm hmm. And it is OK to like if you're running one race and you decide you don't like that anymore, it's OK to switch. It is OK to change your dreams if you find that they're not making you feel as good as you thought they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, for a long time, thought that I wanted to be a world famous researcher. I didn't really care what the field was. Like I said, I, I found astronomy in college and it could have just as easily been chemistry or, or history or anthropology. But I thought I wanted to be an academic for the rest of my life. And it, it took me a few years in academia, going through the system and seeing how it works to realize actually that dream isn't really for me. I would be much better off uh, for myself 
doing science communication instead of research. So yeah, just do do what feels right to you in the moment. Mm -hmm. Great. What's your favorite science fiction movie? And if you were to write a famous science fiction movie, what's, what, what would you want to be in there? <laughs> science fiction movie is probably... Because I mean, I think you could write Galaxy a great movie. Quest? Don't you think you could write a great movie? With some help, yeah. I, yeah. I do. Well, um, what's, what are your favorite ones movie. that you like? I love the movie Galaxy Quest. I think it's just really funny and well done. And I love that it is not trying to be realistic. I often have problems with movies like Interstellar or Gravity because I feel like they don't get everything right, but people look at them and think that they're realistic. So people feel like they can learn from those movies, but no one's watching Galaxy Quest and saying, oh, that seems real. Um, but. I probably watch more TV than I do movies, and my favorite sci-fi show by far is Stargate. Mmm. I haven't seen that one. Stardate, huh? Oh, it's so good. One of my favorite things about it is that for most of the show, they don't have to deal with spaceships. Uh, instead, they rely on a technology called the Stargate that just instantaneously transports ah, them to another that's planet. Right. And then I don't have to deal with all the stressful space oh, travel, but yeah. I still get the fun of seeing alien worlds. Oh, but all okay. of the alien worlds look like the Pacific Northwest because uh, that's, they like shot it in Vancouver. Right, okay, okay, okay. So you don't have a favorite Star Trek episode or anything, huh? Um, I mean, the, the trouble with Tribbles is always good. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. If you're, yeah, um, I, I think I watched probably more TNG and Enterprise always looked up to Captain Janeway um, okay. as a as as a strong woman. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Well, listen. Thank you so much for taking some time, sharing your ideas, your genius. It's a fantastic book. Uh, we loved having you. you. We look forward to your future success. More books, more stories, more great ideas from coming from, from you. So thank you so much. And maybe a sci-fi movie. Um. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And again, if you come out here, come to the Commonwealth Club, we'll give you a full tour and, uh, and, and introduce you to San Francisco. I'd love that. Thanks great. again for having me. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>